The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, my name's Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another edition of the Engine Room Podcast. Today, I've got the pleasure of interviewing Amy Lucas, who is the practice manager at Burke Britain, um, one of Victorian powerhouse practices. So without any further ado, good morning, Amy. How are you? Morning, Andrew. Great. Thank you. And I, I, beforehand, this is your first ever podcast. So um, it's going to be quite embarrassing for people who've been on many of these when um, when, when you completely ace this one. So I'm just sort of it's pumping your tyres up early. Um, but, um, but welcome. And, and like every podcast... It'd be good to get to know sort of who you are and what your journey has been to get you into a position where you can say, oh, I'm, I'm running this practice, I am the practice manager of, of a well-established business. So over to you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, quite a simple story I, I feel like I've had along my journey. So I was a small town country girl, born and bred back in Portland, uh, about three hours down the coast. So made the decision at about 19 years old to make the big move up to Geelong. It seemed like quite a big move at the time, but looking back, it probably wasn't as dramatic as what I thought it was. Moved along and started a three-year uh, role at Lara Secondary College, so completely outside of financial planning, working at a secondary college, working in the office and administration, um, and then eventually uh, found my way to Burke Britain almost 12 years ago. So I uh, Entered the financial planning industry as a receptionist, had absolutely no idea what was going on out the back. I just sat in reception, <laughs> greeted clients, made coffees, handed files to the right people, and uh, obviously sort of, uh, you know, just threw myself right into the role 12 years ago with the practice. And can I ask you, and, 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 and really interesting, um, uh, this particular sort of way in which people understand the business, it's fair to say at reception that you do understand what clients think of you and what, what suppliers think of you. And, and early days, what, what was the sort of feeling that you felt that the clients had towards your practice? And I imagine part of your answer is why you stayed. Yeah, yeah. No, I could tell the clients really, um, they valued us. They valued the planners out the back. They valued the relationships they had with the staff. Um, a lot of the staff had been here for many, many years. So they would almost greet each other like family, you know, coming into reception and hugs and kisses and and big warm welcomes. So just seeing that happen, even if it was for a brief few minutes as people were entering or exiting the building, it it really encouraged me. Hey, something pretty good's probably happening here that I might want to hang around for. And where where when you were sitting sort of at early days, were you kind of figuring out and, and some people like this sort of ways that things could be done better in the office? Probably not so much. So I, I actually stayed on reception for just six months. So it was a bit of a fresh fresh entry into into the business. Um, after that, I moved into doing Jay's. So one of the owners of the business and financial planners, I moved into his personal assistant role. So uh, quite a newbie just from out the front after six months straight out the back, uh, getting into the files, getting into what financial planning actually was about. And um, what is it about? 
<laughs> I'm still trying to work that out, Andrew. I don't know. Twelve years later, I'm still my head's still spinning. But um, you know, it 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 was a big learning curve coming from no background, uh, three years working in administration somewhere else, and then and then working in uh, quite a fast paced industry with a lot of tick boxes. So it was a very steep learning curve. And 12 years ago, you would have, I mean, the majority of time that you've been involved in the business has coincided with the the future of financial advice legislation. So um, all you've known is change. So, um, and then where did you go from there? So you were working um, sort of in the financial planning administration, assisting with clients. What were the next steps for you in the business? Yeah, so I spent about five years, four or five years doing Jay's personal assistant role. And um, back then, it really was personal assistant, everything from picking up the washing to preparing the files, everything in between. Um, At that stage, after that four or five years, I had a great opportunity to step into the practice manager role. I was quite nervous given I didn't have the education or the experience and background in financial planning. Obviously, I had a few years under my belt at that stage, so I had a fair idea of uh, what the business would need in a practice manager. Um, But I decided to grab it with both hands and run with it at that point. I just didn't want to look back and regret saying no for that opportunity. So I just took it. Well, having experience running a ladies college and and pushing around sort of teenage children probably gives you a, a reasonable basis of running financial planners. Now, in saying that, what 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 sort of lessons or, or that have you've learned um, in the last five or six years that have really moulded the way in which you conduct yourself, or, and and also um, the way in which you're running the business? Yeah, a lot of lessons. I think um, about myself, I've probably learnt that I'm not naturally a leader. It's something I've had to really work on. So I've done a a few courses, a few seminars, a few things outside of work that have really helped shape me. Um, not naturally being in management or a management role, I've sort of had to learn on my feet as I've gone through through the role and through the business. Um, but I've really enjoyed it. I enjoy a challenge. I enjoy working hard. I enjoy people and working with people and helping them achieve uh, what their goals are. So I think um, the lessons are probably say yes to a lot of things. So I try to say yes, even if it's out of my comfort zone, say yes, go with it embrace it, experience it, um, and and try not to be so hard on yourself. I think I've really, really learned that, you know, it's not the end of the world if something doesn't work out. You can pivot, you can change change your pathway, um, and you just got to keep working on it. And you mentioned you did some, you've, you've done some courses that have helped you. What, what were the main types of ones that you've done, just for other people who are, who are embarking on this? And did you do that in person or or online, what, what what was the ones that, that you can remember were successful? You don't have to remember the names, but just the, the topics. Yeah, interestingly, they haven't been management courses per se, and they haven't been financial planning based. So one that I completed in Melbourne pre-COVID in person was called Landmark. Uh, so that focused a lot on not spinning stories in your head pretty much and not um, not diving into some spiral of what might happen or has happened. So that, that was really good. It was Like I said, it wasn't uh, management-based. It was more personal-based and personal growth. Uh, So I did that one. And at the moment, I actually still do weekly at the moment, Echelon Front, which is around extreme ownership. So it's about leadership, ownership, um, you know, taking taking control of your own decisions and helping those around you become leaders as well. So I've really focused on personal growth more than anything, you know, certificate-based or financial planning-based. It's always been on my radar to do something like that. But for myself, in my role, I've really liked the growth side of things more than ticking a box for some sort of compliance or or knowledge. And what we might do is we might um, uh, just just attach a few of those links, um, attach this podcast, uh, Echelon Front, I think you mentioned was was, was, was one of the ones that you're actually still involved in. So um, I think you're right. Um, the, the, The fact that the engine room focuses on practice managers is the skills and the disposition to run the operations of a business quite often is not natural, that natural outgoing uh, sort of uh, extrovert nature that, 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 that quite a lot of financial planners um, uh, exhibit. Whether they are or they are not, that's for them and the listeners to actually decide. But they, they quite often have to do that because generally in, in, a, in a meeting, um, the main role of a, of a planner in a meeting is to get people to do things that they know they should in a time frame they otherwise wouldn't. So, uh, you know, there's probably a bit of bravado there. Um, and, and, and acknowledging that that was one of your, your points where you needed to, 
um, mm. develop is is you know the key to success. So um, now after so you you moved three hours so Portland's three hours south of um, of Geelong is that right? It is. I yes. didn't know there was a three hours south of Geelong. It must be on the water, is it? You just keep driving. A lot of people know Warnable, but right. just keep keep driving an hour and you'll hit Portland. So it's quite a small town. Not a lot of job opportunities. Uh, like I said, moving to Geelong was was big. I think we have one set of traffic lights in Portland at the time when I left. So big move for a small girl. Uh, perfect, perfect. And um, Geelong, you've settled in twelve years now. Let's talk about um, this business that you found yourself. Uh, initially starting in and now and now being quite operational in um, Burke, Britain. So, to give the listeners a bit of an idea of the scale. Um, how many advisors do you have? What does your back office look like? Maybe just give me a bit of an idea, please. Yeah, sure. So we've got about a team of twelve. Uh, most of us are based in Geelong, and four of those twelve are ARs. So those ARs have been with us ten plus years. The four of them, and two of them being actually the the owners of the business, so Peter Burke and Jay Burke. Besides that, we have some administrators, we have a receptionist, and we actually have one ongoing full-time power planner now as well. When I look at Peter and Jay, a father and son, is that right? Yes. Interesting, interesting duo combination with family, but works well. Okay. And um, and having you involved, because I've looked at your website and you're, you're, you've got even footing on the front row there, so to speak, do you find yourself, how do you how do you play with the, the, the fathers and, and, and the son as far as sort of working with both of them? I'm really curious. No, we, we, we do well. Uh, Peter and Jay, they have quite a balance, so it's it's quite good. I try to be the middle voice of reason for the two of them. Um, being father and son and me having worked here 12 years, we have quite an honest, open relationship. So, you know, you, you're not trying to not tread on toes with anyone, which is really good. Uh, you can you can give your opinion and you can have an opinion come back at you and, and not be flustered or upset about it. You know, it really is just factual at the end of the day. So I, th- I think it works well. Oh, absolutely. And I think having that circuit break is probably quite smart. Um, now, with four advisors um, and you've got a, a team of eight in operations, um, uh, they're not all doing the same role. So wh- 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 how do you break them down? Do, do you operate in a pod system, so one AR, or, or is it a collective? Maybe get us a feel for that, please. We've tried a few things over the years, Andrew. Uh, we've tried the PA role over the years for each planner. Each planner has a PA. We've tried pod systems, silos, all sorts of things. But I think what we've really come back to as a business still is having one main person that takes care of that client, uh, whether it that client belongs to Jay, Peter, Ben, Delta. Um, having that client know who they contact has really worked best for us. So when they call, they ask for that support staff member and, and they develop that relationship with that support staff member as well. Um, relationships obviously pay, play a really huge key part of the business. Um, so it, it is almost like silos. The planners know who to go to in the staff for each client and that works really well. And and the, the type of business that, I mean, you're in Geelong and Geelong is, is uh, you know, parts of it very urban, parts of it's very sort of industrial and and you are close to sort of agriculture as well. So what's the type of clients that Burke Britain has and and what's their, I suppose, their target market? It's something that we've worked really hard on over the last few years. So we did a lot of work with PWC and our cost to serve our ideal clients. Each planner probably would have a different opinion or way they express their ideal client. But for us, we, we want clients that want to engage. So that probably sounds really broad. But we, we have clients all the way from 18, 19 years old up to 80, 90 years old. Uh, we have a variety of advice we provide. But for us, it's more about the client wanting and appreciating and enjoying the relationship and advice they receive from the business. So we have clients that come in and they're, they're not so great at returning paperwork or booking appointments. And for us, that's just at the end of the day, not really an ideal client because it, it's very hard to coordinate a relationship with someone who's not actively involved. So for us, I mean, obviously we have an ideal client in terms of funds under management, advice we want to provide. Each of our planners have a nice niche area of advice they like providing. So we have Ben who really enjoys the farming and self-managed super fund aspect And then we have Delta, who really enjoys the younger clients who are starting families. Peter really uh, pivots towards DVA, Centrelink, those sort of types of advice. So the planners definitely have their preferences on the enjoyment in which advice areas they give. 
However, at the end of the day, if that client is participating in the process, that that's the best kind of client for us. Yeah, look, you mentioned the word engagement and participation. And I think, you know, 10, 15 years ago, financial planners would put up with a client who was unresponsive or potentially um, you felt like you had to babysit them. But, um, you know, anecdotally, they always made bad clients. Mm. Um, they, because when, when things are good, um, it's they're the ones that made it good. And when things are bad, it's you. So um, I think, uh, so what's your definition of engagement? So you're taking on a new client. Um, and, and you've, by the way, you've given us quite a broad church there as far as what Peter, Ben and Delta and Jay do. Um, how do you get a gut feel is if, if they are going to be engaged and, and, um, do you charge, uh, do you run through? So when you take on a client, is it quite a rigorous process up front to get, to get a feel for that? We do. We, we've learned a little bit in the past couple of years, uh, almost a filtering process. So when the clients do come in, they do have a filtering phone call where they'll speak with someone and we'll sort of gauge where they're at, why they've contacted us, what they're looking for. We have that filtering process in place. Past that point, if they're happy to proceed, we do offer a first appointment, which we do charge for now. Okay. Uh, so that PWC piece really taught us to value our time and um, almost filter that client by charging for the first appointment to see if they're interested in proceeding as a client long term. And are you unsurprised when, 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 when you first brought that in, what was the what was the reaction for when the advisors first got confirmation that people were willing to pay for their time? It was a very interesting conversation within the staff. So I personally said, we cannot charge for the first appointment. We will have no one come in. Everyone will say no. Um, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna take us backwards in the business. It it did not do that at all. Good to it lose worked. sometimes, Amy. It's good to <laughs> lose. <laughs> it's, it's good to be wrong. In this instance, I was glad I was wrong because it really has not slowed down our growth or our new appointments at all. If anything, it's really um, solidified the clients that do come in proceeding and wanting to proceed. So it, it's actually worked really well for our business. And what's the range of, of, of payments? Uh, so we, for our ongoing clients... No, 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 no just, just, just for, the, for the first meeting. That's all I'm after. Yeah, we just charge an hourly hourly rate for the first appointment. Yep. So uh, we, we, we're basically charging for the planner's time. Perfect, but which is, which is what a profession does. So, exactly. so well done. And um, you've got, I've just had a look at the numbers, you've got one para planner um, sort of looking after your entire client base. Um, shout out, what's your para planner's name? So her name's Chris. She's actually the only one that's based in Melbourne, so outside of our office. Right. Uh, and uh, how does Chris keep through all work? <laughs> no, she does a great job. So Chris joined us about two years ago. Para planning for the business is something that has been a constant push and pull struggle in terms of numbers, compliance, costs, staffing. So about two years ago, Chris joined us as actually a coordinator of our para planning. So Chris joined and she was more uh, pushing the files between contract para planners, you know, working with the planners on things they needed to update or change, working on templates. However, about six to eight months ago, Chris wanted to move into full-time para planning. That was her original background. So we said, let's do it. Let's let's put you in para planning. So we do contract out the remainder of our plans that Chris can't get through every week. Perfect. Uh, but it's working really well to have an in-house para planner, and uh, it, it's worked fantastically for the team. I get to see a lot of practices in in my my various roles, and um, unequivocally, the, the the ones that seem to have the least problems and the most happiness, if that is possible, in para planning or advice delivery, are people who've got a, an in-house point of escalation. Um, they might have a contractor, um, either Australian or overseas, um, and what that person um, in in the office does is they not only do the work, but they also do a quality assurance on the rest of it as well. So um, it, it seems to be the way in which it works. Um, but they are they are a scarce breed para planning, um, in, in, and it's uh, um, because I suppose it's a it's a tough gig. It's a tough gig there. Um, and the types of plans. Do you do anything unusual in your plans? Um, you mentioned. Uh, ben does agri and a lot of self-managed super funds. So is there particular types of complexities that you do that, that are quite stimulating? Uh, self-managed super funds are probably one of our main powerhouse drivers for advice. So almost almost a quarter of our client advice documents are self-managed super funds. So that's quite a heavy area for us. Uh, we do a lot of insurance, particularly for new clients coming on board, just making sure they're where they need to be with their insurance. 
Um, but the the two contractors that we focus on passing plans out to, they've been with us over 10 years as well. So Beck and Brooklyn uh, have been contracting for 10 years. So let's give them a shout out. Wait, what's, the, what's the name of their firm? Uh, so they're, they're just at home power planners. Uh, okay. Well, just, just working solely. So uh, uh, their focus is really on getting plans turned around and back to us on time. They know the little quirks that the plan is like. They know the business compliance and what we need. So it's working fantastically with them on board as well. And and 10 years, the relationship's there. Oh, look, I think, um, you know, I, I hear 12 years of yourself, 10 years here. Um, there's a bit of tenure. And later on, we're going to talk about people and culture. And, I'm, I'm, and that's probably going to tease out a little bit of the why, why people hang around. Um Good. In relation to uh, sort of your your business as running the business, you mentioned you do a, a lot of life insurance. Now, that's not something that a lot of practices are, are, are gun ho for. Um, how are you rolling that out? Is it is it standalone or is it part of an overall package? And and um, is there any uh, I suppose advice or tips you've got for the insurers out there, good or bad? Yes. Yeah, so insurance, it's been a sticking point definitely for the business, but it's something our planners really feel strongly needs to be incorporated in advice pieces. So um, it's very difficult to scope it out knowingly when you know it probably needs to be reviewed quite quite frequently. Every couple of years, at least, we review for our ongoing clients. Definitely the process for new applications is quite difficult. Um, Pre-assessments is something that we've reviewed over and over and over the last few years. We have a very thorough template for our pre-assessments for insurance applications that we have the clients fill in in advance. We get the insurers to review in advance. And there's always, I would say nine out of 10 times, there's a, just a, something that pops its head up through the underwriting process that no one expected. Sometimes a client doesn't even have a memory of something that's happened because it's so long ago. So our insurers that we use, um, they're quite supportive, but there's always a, a bit of a delay with our insurance files, unfortunately. Oh, that's all right. And look, um, it's 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 good that um, you know that you are looking at holistically at that at that particular facet. And you did mention your your advisors are passionate about it. I think it's the way they're wired. Um, do you offer estate planning or referrals out to an estate planning business? Yep. So we actually refer out estate planning. We have several connections with our local uh, solicitors. So we use Howard Andrews in Geelong. We use Succession Succession Legal. They're actually just a couple blocks up the street. We use Aspire, who we've recently connected with. So we really like to have a variety of different solicitors because everyone's needs are different. Each uh each solicitor has a different area they focus in. So we like to have a broad a broad connection with different practices that we can send clients out to and trust that they're going to be taken care of. The passion's obvious in, in your voice. Um, how, can I ask, um, how are you guys licensed? So we're licensed through AMP. Okay. And um, have you been with them for a long time or a, new, a short time? A very long time. So Peter originally, the practice principal, uh, he went uh, from GIO, so back in the GIO days, obviously not very familiar for myself, but uh, GIO over to AMP, and that was about 22 years ago, I believe. So um, we've been with AMP that that whole ride, that whole time. Perfect. And um, when 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 you're talking about the advice delivery, we spoke, you know, just about life insurance. Then, um, how do you manage uh, the investments? Do you have an SMA or an MDA? Um, what's what's the philosophy for your group on managing investment, or is it just a free for all? Uh, I wouldn't say it's a free for all. We have been looking into SMAs for the client's benefit and efficiency purposes. Uh, we've been working with Investsense really closely and probably heading down that pathway pretty quickly. Um, but at the moment, we have a monthly investment committee meeting where the planners sit on. We often invite externals to join that meeting so that we can get an, a perspective and see where they're at. Um, and we use a range of managed funds and we outsource to Shore and Partners for our share purchases as well. So a bit of a variety. Um, some of the clients, we also put on a just a simple index fund, just a mix so that we don't have to actively manage them so much. Um, but definitely heading down the SMA pathway that I know a lot of practices have done. Absolutely. And look, that's all part of efficiency for the client and efficiency for the practice. Because last time we looked, clients clients like paying fees, but they like paying it for the bit they see. 
Yes. Not 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 and not not the not inefficiencies the, of a practice, right? So um, definitely. Um, and and a bit about your tech stack. Um, what's the the technology that you guys use to deliver advice? So we we actually were on Coin right up until the end, and I'm not sure if Coin is. So a few uh, people, few people listening today <laughs> weren't born um, yeah. when, when Coin started, but 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 I, I, I I've used Coin before as well, so it's it's okay. I was very used to it, obviously, you know, 10 years or so in the practice using Coin, but uh, Jay and I did a lot of due diligence around where to move after that. We met with a lot of different providers to see where the, the business would sit with our tech, and eventually we landed on Fin365. Um, we've moved over to Fin365 and uh, for our CRM, our revenue management, and then we're still using Xplan, obviously, for our, our advice preparation. So our power planners predominantly use Xplan. Um, and we use Fin365, which is, which has worked really well for us. We're really enjoying Fin365. Oh, shout out to the Fin365 people. Um, and your practice is it? Do you do you, um do you do um are you multidisciplinary at all? Do you do debt? Do you do accounting, or is that referred out? We refer out at the moment, so we refer out for lending, estate planning, obviously share broking. So at the moment, we just focus on the financial planning aspect. And make sure those connections in the community are really good to to push clients out to when needed. G- given given where you guys are at in our previous conversations, right. um, is there any one of those disciplines that you would consider bringing in house um, if if the opportunity arose? Absolutely, uh, Jay, Peter, and I have been in a lot of discussions the past eighteen months around accounting practices, around lending practices, and also financial planning practices. So we feel we're in a really good position to start looking at acquisitions. Of those kind of practices. In saying that, um, do you, with the way in which you run the business of the business, do you guys have a business coach, or what's the sort of rhythm, or how, is there any philosophies that you employ to run the business? Because you are the tether between, I hate to say, it, the back office, the front office, the clients, the experience. Is there anything that you use? Um, we don't have a business coach, and we don't have a system as such that we use for that sort of stuff. It really is probably a bit of a key person role that I'm running at the moment between keeping the, the practice, the compliance, the staffing, uh, keeping it all all held together at the moment. And uh, you touched on um, key person, you touched on staffing. Right now, the hottest, the hottest topic in not just financial planning, but everything in Australia is talent. Okay. We're, we're a people business, um, but people cost money and we've got to, we've got to deploy them effectively. So, what I would like to ask is why people join Burke Britain, why people stay, and you've got a few tenured people there, and what your plan is as the practice manager to ensure that the growth is evenly spread in your talent from your ARs all the way through to your most recent recruit. Yes, so uh, heavy question, heavy question. Um, we do, we do have some long tenure staff members, but I think we can honestly say we've had quite a high turnover also. In the past four or five years, I think given the industry, the level of compliance, um, the work that sits behind, you know, you, you advertise it as as an administrator coming on board, and they don't realise what's what's hit them in the back office often because it's it's such a deep industry that you know you you picture creating a few forms, but it's really about the relationship. So. For us, um, we, we like to focus on the person more than the certificates or education that they've received, and that's held us in steadfast. So Ben and Delta, for example, both being current ARs, um, have come from uh, right, right through administration, they've touched on power planning, and moving into their AR roles has really given them the grounding for the role they're in now so that they've learned the business from the ground up. So so they're the type of people that we're looking for. So just just, just confirming, um, two of your ARs, Ben and Delta, didn't start as ARs. They started in, in which particular role in the organisation? Just straight administration. So Delta's been with us, I think it's coming up 17 years actually. Delta's uh, it started in their office as well. Same with Ben. And we do make that very clear when staff come on board. You know, we want someone who wants to be involved in the whole practice, not just walk into a seat as an AR and be handed a bunch of clients. We want the knowledge of the practice. We want them to know the why and the how and, and everything in between that as a small practice. And and being a small practice, you, you have to know what happens everywhere because there's often sidesteps short-term or long-term into different roles that you're going to need to be across 
if you want to succeed in the business. And you mentioned one thing, and, and first of all, don't beat yourself up over the last couple of years. There was a particular a pandemic that happened to hit Victoria yes. harder than most. So there's been it's been a tough gig. Um, the, the 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 thing you highlighted, which is that administration and financial planning is 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 way more than administration generally, where you have to have a deep empathetic knowledge of the clients. You have to have relationship skills as well. Um, is there anything that you do when you're bringing those team members through or you'd you'd like um, the industry to do to help um, that segment of the business. And why I bring that up is that good planners are only as good as the people around them. Definitely. I I think there's not enough support for the administration side in financial planning. So ARs obviously get a lot of support with PD days, uh, CPD, learning knowledge. For us as a back office, there's not a lot of that happening. Hence why I went out and found my own um, PDs like Landmark and Echelon Front. So I, I source a lot of that for myself and my own growth. Um, a lot of it is just on the ground learning for our team, to be honest, um, because systems and processes change so often and compliance changes so often that you can have a process manual for everything, but <laughs> you know you can have a staff member come in next week and the process has changed due to, due to something that's happened. So um, a lot of it is on the ground learning, which I think um, can be a, a big challenge for people. Um, but we're only open to suggestions and ideas for professional development, either from our licensee or outside of outside of that. Uh, we're very open to saying yes to supporting our staff, either professionally or personally, with any courses or any days they want to go and do. Great. First of all, great. The second anecdotal, I suppose, um, as part of being part of Ensemble, I was having a chat to Emily um, the other day, who's sort of the head of community, and um, that sentiment of is there a place for people to learn peer-to-peer learning or getting resources who aren't ARs, um, it just is an avalanche. Um, yeah. We're finding that people are reaching out to Emily saying, hey, look, I'm not on the far, but I've been in this practice for 15 years. Um, can I join the business? And if I do, where do I go? So um, we, we definitely do want the entire sort of ecosystem to be part of Ensemble. And if you're out there listening... And you're either logging in as your advisor, <laughs> right? Um, feel free just to reach out. You know, this is this is part of of us um, trying to build the positive evolution of financial advisors via positive evolution of their of their practices. Um, yeah. And there's probably a big push for for a bit more support around practice managers. Um, as you said, it's 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 there's a real people component of of getting this right and. Um, we're probably underdone because we're so focused on compliance in, in, in financial services. Um, we're probably underdone on people skills um, as far as, uh, you know, compared to other industries. So, um, yeah, when a quick question I was going to ask is when, um, when COVID happened and, and you guys all, all work from home, what's the bounce back been? I mean, you're, you're not regional, but you're, you're, not, you're not in the city of Melbourne. Um, a, a, are your team now all back in the office? Are they hybrid? Where do you sit now? And what's your philosophy? So when COVID happened, we picked up our laptops and we went home, uh, just like many other practices. We, uh, have, we have encouraged that split of in the office and working from home since then. So uh, the flexibility of being able to work from home and come in the next day has been amazing for our staff. So we, we've really encouraged that. Being in Geelong, I thought a lot of clients would want to pick up the in-person appointments after COVID restrictions were relaxed, but everyone loves Zoom. You know, I think maybe one in two appointments uh, are skipped and they're taken to Zoom now. So it's been a real efficiency driver for us as well, uh, which has been fantastic. Um, it's meant that, you know, we've been able to focus on other things. So it, I know that it was a, a quite a turning point for a lot of people, COVID, um, for the business, we just did not slow down. We picked up new clients with the staff, pushed through, you know, we worked from home. We did lots of fun stuff for our staff working from home. So we sent out uh, the the uh, the food boxes so that they can cook their meals and we're all cooking the same meal even though we're all at our own homes. I sent out, you know, fun little party packs so that they had something to do on the weekends with their kids. We, we tried to really keep that up. Uh, we also did this is probably a horror one for some of the staff. We did exercise classes. We we hired a PT trainer and we'd be all up at 7.30 in the morning on Zoom working out together. So I don't know if that's given anyone PTSD, but 
you know, it was funny. We all laugh about it. We've got some great screenshots of the staff all in their gym clothes in the morning before work. So, I mean, you know, we had to adapt and we really did adapt. I'm, I'm, I'm picturing fluoro tights and leg warmers <laughs> for one week and then you're sending them a, a 5,000 calorie slow roast pack yes. on the weekend. So, uh, no, it definitely was a thing. And that, that led me to uh, a question of how do you how do you guys have fun? So, so, um, I'll, I'll, so I'll, I'll wind that one back. With York, with Burke Britain, do you guys set quarterly goals, annual goals? What's the way in which you guys set your company goals? And how do you articulate and share that journey with your team? Yeah, at the moment, we do have one-on-one catch-ups with our staff to review their progress. Generally, they're held quarterly. So we like to stay in really close touch with our staff members one-on-one. We have a bit of a, a barley challenge with a, with a new business upfront goal um, that's dollar base that we're trying to hit at the end of financial year and we'll all head off to Bali. So we've got some fun whiteboards drawn up with some beer bottles, some bintang bottles that we're filling up but each month. We review how the new business has gone per planner and as a team, as a total. So we like to keep it pretty fun and lighthearted um, and, and, and it gets everyone involved in the business goal at the end of the day. That's brilliant, by the way, um, because it's visual um, and it's 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 bringing people together. And look, I I, I mean, it's it's now uh, we're in the fourth month of the year. How are you guys going? Let's go public. <laughs> <laughs> we're tracking not too bad. We've got some high goals, uh, but I think it's not the goal that's such the focus for everyone. It's it's the team team value around that goal and every month we all you know sit with bated breath as we update our whiteboard and you know everyone's jarring each other about where they're at or where they're heading and you know they're all you know saying oh I've got this in the pipeline it's going to happen next month so I'm counting it already you know it's it's a bit of fun Uh, but the serious note is the end goal that's a business goal really at the end of the day. Cool is this the first time you've done this sort of exercise or the first time after COVID? It's the first time after COVID. So it's, it's something that was put together as, um, yeah, a, a bit of a lighthearted goal amongst the team. Um, besides that, we really enjoy catching up together. So I'll book, I try to do something once a month as a team. Um, so I like to really mix it up. So last month was 10 pin bowling. We've done private Bikram, brick, Bikram yoga Pilates classes together. Um, all sorts of stuff. You know, sometimes someone will mention a book and we've all got to read the book by the end of next month. So we all like to have a bit of input. We sit around and have uh, lunch together at the end of each month. Um, it's Being a small team, you can't hide from that sort of stuff. So everyone that's here is really involved in that that culture of getting to know each other and getting along. And look, the, the, the tenures speak for themselves now. Um, just getting a feel for having a look at your overall business, Quite often, you know, why people join a practice is not why they they stay. And there's a whole range of reasons why people stay. And, and it could be going to Bali, but it could also be things such as, you know, are you charitable? What are you giving back, et cetera? Is there any, um, does Burke Britain, um, are they involved in charitable pursuits or, or any of those kind of arrangements? And if so, do you involve your team in any way? We do. We have some really close relationships with some community uh, community areas. Um, so one of our, our main areas of charitable giving is our Future Generations Donation Program. So that is 1% of some shares that clients hold. Instead of paying fund managers and you know paying the bills on their end, it's actually donated back to local charities. And us and our clients and our staff, we get to decide where those funds are dispersed. So last year, for example, we had over $150,000 in funds and we go out to our clients and say, who would you like to nominate? Who should we look at to provide those funds to? So some local ones we've provided are Kids Plus Foundation, Geelong Mums, we have uh, Geelong Youth Engagement, so we have a lot of connections with those areas and we love to support them. So we'll go to their lunches, their golf days. We've volunteered at Geelong Mums. You know, I've had Peter and Jay packing baby clothes on a Friday afternoon and learning about how important supporting children and young families in Geelong is. So um, we try to involve the staff in that as much as possible. We help at the Bunnings Lions Club, you know, barbecues, all sorts of things. I'm just going to... I suppose get you to uh, repeat how you do that. So one percent of what the billable fees that that would otherwise go to your practice 
gets apportioned on your P&L into a charitable foundation. Is that correct? Not quite. So not our personal practice. We wouldn't be taking the 1%. It would be the Future Generation Fund. Got it. So they actually donate that back. And due to our holdings and the size of our holdings, we get to nominate. So they do have some charities on their list who do receive funds, but being uh, being quite a large practice, we get to decide. So that's, I think we're in our fifth or sixth year now of getting to be part of that program. And it's amazing. We've sponsored a guide dog. You know, we took a guide dog all the way through from wow. being a puppy and he's now he's now supporting someone that needs a guide dog. So it's been amazing. You've got 12 people in your practice and you gave away $150,000 last year. That's that's a that's really, huge. really, it's really positive. And I, I just waited through your website and, and you've, you've got a running total of $550,000 odd in charitable giving, which which is the real deal, right? So it's it goes to show you. So if you're out there and and uh, you're looking for a role model on a, on a uh, not just a per capita but an absolute basis, and even a methodology of giving, some people want to give, but it just gets complicated in how they do it. It sounds like the method that that you've uh, that you've established seems to be sustainable um, and and you know material as well. So well done, well done to you. Um, and. Look, I know that you're you're in a big licensee, and that licensee has lots of training and development for their um uh, for their uh, advisors and whatnot. Is there any other sort of training points that that you put in place in your business? Um, probably just the main CPD that the planners participate in at the moment. So, um, outside of that, we encourage them to keep their eye open for any personal development that they'd like to do as well. Um, we have monthly planner meetings where the four of them catch up and discuss strategy. And investment options as well. So we, we honestly, we've been quite uh, in our own world for quite a long time. Hence, in the last couple of years, we've tried to tried to move into the growth phase and open our open our eyes and our doors and and really look out now and and see what's out there for the team and for the business. So going into a growth phase is is, is definitely one thing. Saying you are, but do you do you believe that you've built the platform right now? So that you can plug in, whether it be uh, new advisors or new disciplines or, or new practices, what what have you built that you think is is sustainable, and um and or have you got a little way to go on that? I think I think we're ready. I think we're very ready. We've got the tech, we've got the tech piece down pat, we've got the staffing down pat, uh, we've got the revenue management down pat. The culture is just sitting at such a fantastic level. We're ready for anyone to enter and join from administration right up to AR level, PY candidates, acquisitions of other businesses, you know, we're really poised and we're so open for it as well. You know, we're not worried about a certain area that we need to improve on. We're just, we're open, willing and ready. And you've got history in doing it, right? So um, Ben and Delta have come through um, and they're ARs now and they've come through that. Um, And you mentioned um, PY. Have you got any people in the PY program currently? We do. We have Shay. Shay's running through his PY, so he's actually uh, looking to finish that up, hopefully a little bit earlier, but at the moment he's on track for March next year. Um, and and that's been a big part of our succession plan as well. So Peter, I don't think he'd mind me saying, he's uh, looking into his final years as an AR and as a financial planner. Um, he's been in the business many, many years and he's been part of a succession plan the business has had going for probably six or seven years now. Uh, so that, that's been a really big piece for Ben and Delta succeeding under Peter, sharing his clients. And naturally, the growth of that has seen us see how successful that is. And we're doing the same thing with Shay. So Shay's now starting to succeed under Jay. And that's going to see Jay freed up to spend more time on the practice instead of in the practice. Yeah, cool. And um. If I was to come and uh, so, what's your recruitment process? So, so given that it's very family focused, as far as the collective being the family and the tenure, um, where do you currently get your, your people from? We've we've tried a lot of different methods in attracting new staff. We've done everything from Seek to uh, Deakin Uni, advertising through Deakin Uni. Um, probably our most most successful method though is. Uh, personalities and knowing someone. So someone's come from a second or third party that's referred them. So personal references is a big one for us. Um, Ben, for example, actually grew up in Horsham where Peter grew up. So sort of a third party connection of knowing each other that way. And then Delta was actually hired because 
someone knew of her and knew she was looking for some work. So it's really been a connection. Actually, myself, I actually came because my friend was working here at the time and she referred me. So you still have to go through the interview process. You have to check all the boxes. You have to um, be aligned with the business's philosophies and where we're heading. But for us, the successful method has been uh, uh, references. And given that you've worked with the principals um, very closely for the last decade, what's been the what's been the 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 biggest the biggest error or, or the biggest um, lesson that you've learned when you went down a rabbit hole incorrectly, and and what did you do to make sure you didn't do it again? Yeah, I think there's probably a couple of examples. Well, probably more than a couple examples, if I'm being we're, honest. We're just, it's going to be a three-hour <laughs> podcast, Amy. So we just just we can just truncate that. It'd be great. <laughs> I think. Um, can I give a specific example? Is that okay? Whatever you want. I mean, but we we never edit these things. <laughs> okay, perfect. So, um, I think one main example is our offshore team. So we we saw other practices and we saw during COVID that offshore was a fantastic a fantastic path to go down. At looking at support in our back end, um, having offshore resources, and we pushed we pushed down that pathway for quite a while before we realised it actually just didn't align with where the business was headed in the next couple of years. So um, we called it at the end of the day. We moved back on shore. We hired in-house admin support. Um, and, you know, it's probably just a lesson that uh, you don't have to hang on to something for so long. If it's not working, it's okay to call it. And that goes all the way from tech stacks to staffing to, you know, our processes and systems. If it's not working, yes, you want to give it a bit of a try for a while. You want to try and pivot and tweak what you can. But at the end of the day, if it's not right for the staff or the practice, then it's okay to make a decision to move in a different way. Oh, yeah. And it's, 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 the timing's everything, right? So the, yeah. uh, uh, if you look at the last 10 years, there's been, there's been a, external factors that have meant people move in, in one way or the other. Who would have thought that we'd have pretty well no unemployment? Um, yeah. so, so getting people now is, 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 is tough going. Um, it's tricky. and also you mentioned you did some work with PwC at the beginning of this podcast and without knowing their program, that would have been very much, what are you guys good at? Have you priced them appropriately? You know, so like most practices, um, you probably have reduced the actual numbers of clients over the last five or six years. Would that be right? It's correct. Yes. Hit the nail on the head. <laughs> yeah. So, so if you've got, you know, when, when you actually do that exercise and you, and you get your pricing correct and, you know, right up to you guys are charging for, for, for initial appointments, um, then you, you may not need as, as bigger engine to, to service the, the engaged clients, which is exactly the ones you want. Um, but now you've actually done all of that. You flesh that through. Now's the time to grow again, and I think that's a consistent exactly. theme with a lot of practices. And um, there's literally no competition uh, because there's so few people giving advice, and there's so many good advice givers in Australia running in good practices that that doesn't work. Now, in saying that, um, I would love to hear you've, you've you've sort of intimated a few things um, in relation to practice management, um, administration. You've, you've you've sort of insinuated that there's a bit of a lack of of, of industry uh, support there, and we're hoping at Ensemble that we're beginning to bridge that. But um, what, what's your vision of the future of practices, and in particular, uh, the role of, of, of the practice manager or the general manager? Yeah, so I think for practices in general, um, I think it's so different to how it was 10, 12, 15 years ago, where it was more centralised around that one planner, and they pushed out anything from their end, whereas now we're really seeing the team culture and the clients wanting to be able to access an answer or a staff member anytime they need to. So I'm seeing practices down down the track more head towards more of a, a whole team approach rather than just an individualized What, what does that mean? Uh, so being able to call and talk to anyone. So the re- relationships are huge, huge, not just for us, but I'm sure many other practices know the relationship. If you don't have a great relationship with your team and with your clients, you know, you're not going to go anywhere. You're going to sit and probably fail at the end of the day. So for us, I'm seeing practices probably continue to reinforce their back office more than they ever have in the past. So ensuring that they're poised with technology, IT, personal development, because the back office, I think, is really coming to the forefront almost nowadays. Um, And planners, I think, planners and practice principals and business owners are seeing 
if our back office isn't ready to go and getting what they need, it's just not going to click. It's not going to work for anyone. So I think um, practice managers almost are going to become redundant. So and as much as I hate to say it, I would love to see my role not needed. So like I said earlier, um, being a key person, it's fantastic to be able to have a knowledge of everything across the practice. However, it's a dangerous gen- dangerous position for the practice. So I think practice managers, making myself redundant really shows that I've done my job well because the team's humming, the compliance and systems are in place, and I really don't have to worry about stepping in all the time and, and being there. Well, I don't, think, I don't think the term redundancy is probably going to be completely appropriate. <laughs> I think I think the... Uh, um, uh, building in a redundancy is probably the uh, the correct terminology. There's probably always um, always a role for someone to implement the policy and procedures that you guys have have put in place sure. um, and continually innovate that. But you're correct. There's there's uh, you know I, I, if I steal a phrase from the um, recent Formula One in, in in Melbourne, if you're uh, if you don't have your back office humming well, well the driver comes into the pits. <laughs> And it takes him four minutes or her four minutes to drive off again. You're probably not in the game. So, so I think that, um, and that also is, you know, I'm seeing a, a, a more of a flattening of a remuneration as well. I'm seeing the gap between uh, what the advisors are um, being remunerated and, and and their team um, moving more, making more of an alignment than it ever did. Fair I right. think that reflects the fact that that there's an acknowledgement from the ARs that, that it takes two to tango or three yeah. or four, et cetera. Exactly. Um, and um, what would be, so, you know, I suppose that the conundrum I've got when I'm chatting to yourself is you've, you've built a, a business. It's, it's, you've got lots of long-term tenured people. You have brought people through and you've now in 2023 said we're ready for growth. You know, uh-huh. we're ready for growth. And, and is the, why is that? Is that because, um, you know, part of a succession uh, sort of plan is that you need to grow the business bigger so that the people, there's more opportunities internally. Is that is that the philosophy? Yeah, that's that's probably about it. So so we, we're we constantly looking for ways to grow the individuals in the business. So uh, we're very, very open with the opportunities for our staff members. If you come in and you do six months admin and you decide you love power planning, we want that growth to be there. And to have that, you need the support of other team members. So um, we're really poised to let anyone move in any direction that they really want. But to do that, you have to have a great structure in place and and have a great um, a great team around you who are willing to move sideways or up or down or or wherever they want to go. And you mentioned earlier you'd be you'd be open to um, you know taking people into your team or alternatively you know working with a, a like minded practice. Um, is that is that practice or, or that target um, or ideal um, scenario? Is that a geographically Located in around Geelong, or are you open minded? We're very open minded. Um, COVID has shown us that working remotely and working at distances is fine. We actually have a, a, a serviced office in Shepparton as well. So that's been no problem. Our clients, um, we head up whenever we need to, book a few days, see the clients up in Shepparton. So that's three hours down the highway. We really haven't haven't seen an impact of COVID on that at all. So uh, we're really open to any location, any type of business. Um, like I said, we're poised for PY candidates in particular as Peter and Jay continue to succeed up or uh, into different areas of the business. And, and probably we're starting to think and talk about Ben and Delta doing the same thing. So where do they really want to sit after 10 years of being in the business? Do they want to have a certain type of client that they only ever see? Are they more interested in taking on Peter and Jay's clients because of the family connections? So we're, we're ready to bring those PY candidates in and, and help us when we acquire other practices and bring on new clients. The bit I love about when you talk is it's always we, it's always yep. this. You, 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 real have, you have a sense of, of ownership um, of the direction of the business, which is exactly um, what I'd expect from a, from, a, from a highly motivated sort of practice manager or general manager of, of the group. Well, I think I think, Amy, you've done pretty well for your first podcast. Um, <laughs> con- congr- congratulations. Um, we, uh, the takeouts for me are is that, that um, you are open for people to join you in the PY, okay? Sure. You, and, and you've done it before. Yes. And, and, and those people have stayed and they've flourished and you're now talking about them becoming significant pillars of the business. So there's a track record there. There's a real sort of community. So if you're someone who, who values 
your workmates and 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 wants to ha- build that that relationship with your workmates on a social, then then you're definitely um, the company for them. And finally, you were very confident. You were very confident about the fact you've got the platform. Sure. You know, you've got the tech platform. You're clearly comfortable with your licensing. You're investigating uh, the investment. Um, philosophy, and you're open-minded to you know accounting or, or, or mortgage breaking uh, joint ventures. So, I, ho- I hope the next twelve years. I think they're going to be a little bit more exciting than the last twelve. Maybe is my gut feel. I think so. Yes. Yeah. We've definitely we've we've left compliance behind us. Where we're not focusing on you know all of the things that have happened in the past 10 12 years we're ready to move forward we're excited we're all on board we're all aligned and ready ready for this next phase of the business so like all of the items you just said we're we're good to go we're we're keen come at us and and I asked you before the the session could you name five practice managers who you look up to and you you, you said I can name one or two um, so if you're a practice manager or you're aspiring to be one and you're listening to this, you've probably now got another one to add to your collection. And with that, I'd like to thank you for being on The Engine Room today, Amy, and have a great day. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks for having me.